So we're coming into Cornell University and it's its own uh, wrestling facility, that curved dome building. Uh, curved, that big white one, Bartels Hall, it's for Cornell Ice Hockey. That building, the Rust Building, is made of it's an old 70s building made of steel, it just rusts naturally. We're gonna park in this beautiful old house called the AD White House. Andrew Dixon White used to be the president of Cornell. Uh, he was the scholar who was brought in by Ezra Cornell to found the university, so... This is where my office is in Rockefeller Hall. We share it with Asian studies and physics. It's, it's yeah, yeah, we're going up the stairs into Rockefeller Hall, uh, passing the Swartz of the Turin, which is a big lecture theatre. So this is the area of physics, and uh, there's an interesting little room at the top of the corridor here. Um, always amuses me. First of all, I'll show you Foucault's pendulum. Foucault's pendulum, this is swinging all the time. Um, it's, a, it's a way of measuring, it subtly changes as the earth rotates. Come on in. Welcome to my office. That's my honorary degree from Maastricht University. You know, I've, my books have been translated to many, these bears go, many different languages. So you'll probably see Chinese there. This whole shelf of books here are books I've been editing. There's over 50 for uh, MIT, Famous University Press, which I'm an editor of the series there. I told you I'm interested in UFOs, so there. Look, there's a book on UFOs. Nice. Uh, Paris science, French science, and then just shows my different interests. There's there's interviews with John Lennon and Yoko Ono. So suddenly you switch between sociology, weird French science, and then sound. There's the Oxford sound, Handbook of Sounds that I've just finished editing. And the 60s, all stuff about, uh, you know, acid dreams, psychedelia, all that. Cracked media, the sound of malfunction. You just pick up random books here. What type of malfunction are we talking about? Glitches, digital glitches. So how, you know, in analog synthesizers, when things don't work properly, Brian Eno famously had this problem with his first synthesizer. He'd give it to his tech, and the tech would always want to repair it, and he had to leave a note on it. Please leave the ring modulator broken. It's meant to be broken. That's the way I want it to be. So in analog synthesis, it's well known when things don't work properly, you get interesting sound. Well, this guy wrote this whole book about digital glitches. So, you know, you get digital things happening, like when your CD doesn't play properly. And that glitch is a whole art form now. So, Magic Music from the Telemannion. This is an amazing book. Um, but the first ever attempt to pipe music, built in the 1890s, this is one of the very first electronic instruments before they had um, tubes. So it was worked off a gigantic dynamo. And it was in Telemonian Hall in Manhattan. They would pipe the music through telephone wires to restaurants. And you could you would play at a keyboard, would play at this gigantic machine. Incredible story. I met the guys who built this device. They live in Copenhagen. This device is called a sound ear. And in all kindergartens in uh, uh, Denmark, you'll find this, find this device. This is spreading throughout Scandinavia. It's a, a monitoring device for monitoring the level of sound in a room. But if you picks up, wow, loud sound, it starts to go yellow. And if the loud sound continues too long, it starts to go warning, 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 turns red. Sound levels in kindergartens are unbelievably high. And they did a study and they found not only were their ears being damaged, but their vocal cords were being damaged because each kid was shouting louder and louder. Huh. First developed for rock bands practicing in Copenhagen because they thought rock bands were getting their he er hearing damaged and then they adapted it for use in schools and uh, it's spread, it's used in gyms, it's used in hospitals the biggest market is hospitals in America where when people come out of anaesthetic they're absolutely sensitive to sound and um, you want to have those areas very quiet and Hospitals have got noisier and noisier, paradoxically, because there's so many technologies in hospitals. I was instrumental in a new approach in understanding science called the Sociology of Scientific Knowledge. If you go on Wikipedia, you'll see I'm famous for having founded a field called Social Construction of Technology, which is for understanding how 
society gets in and culture gets inside of technology. And then the third one is this area of sound studies. And I just edited um, with a Dutch historian of sound, Karen Westerfeld, with Handbook of Sound Studies, which is all about sound in science, technology, and medicine, and some in across music. So it's trying to understand why the sonic dimension has been neglected. Most work has been on the visual. In the humanities and social sciences, people write a lot about visual stuff but it's much harder to write about sound. Big interest is in Robert Moog. I wrote this biography, The History of the Moog Synthesizer, Analog Days, with my student Frank Trocco, and uh, I often give talks. So I have masses of archives on... Oh, there's a picture of David Borden, first ever live synthesizer ensemble, and their duck. Mother Mallard was the name of the band, so they have a duck. Old Moog gear, when they first introduced it, makes waves. This is a the Sonic 5, so this preceded the Sonic 6 synthesizer, which was about the time of the Mini Moog, Memory Moog sound charts. So that's another very early synthesizer, the Memory Moog. Now those are photographs inside Mini Moog's being produced. And my fat pal Keith, prog rock legend, in his prog rock, prog rock finer with his Monster Moog. Uh, looking the other night about Don Buchla. There is Don Buchla and St Stuart Brand at a famous festival in San Francisco called Trips Festival, which is uh, the attempt to do an electronic simulation of an LSD trip. And this festival, uh, the Grateful Dead were playing there. It was still called the, the Charlatans in those days. Uh, Big Brother and the Holden Company, a famous San Francisco band, which Janis Joplin later played with. It's before Janis even played and were playing. Steve Jobs was in the audience. This was... Um, Bill Graham's first ever gig that he was the kind of did the ticketing for, he got going at this gig. Legendary thing, and on stage was Don Buchla. It controlled everything through a Buchla synthesizer. The lights and the sound ran through a Buchla synthesizer. It's one of the first big happening events on the West Coast. So the reason we have synthesizers like Moog and Buchla is that they were incredibly lucky because there's a whole new genre of music developing, psychedelic music. and Electronic sounds were absolutely beautiful for that music. It was just right because the psychedelic movement wanted strange washes of sound, strange filtered sound, unusual instruments like sitar took off in this period. That's the Mini Moog A, the first prototype of the first Mini Moog. We actually found that in a, David Borden owned it, in a basement in um, the East Coast. Tondo's expanding headband, the biggest analog synthesizers on a show called Mid Midnight Special. What's the Botnik? famous composer who did Silver Apples of the Moon on his, his Buchla 100 synthesizer. A letter from Bob Moog to Herb Deutsch, December 1973. Bob came to this concert that Herb put on in New York City and that's when they met for the first time to discuss building the very first synthesizer. They'd actually met before this, so they met the second time. Bob came to New York, the Fluxus Art Movement was happening, it was a happening scene and Bob tape recorded the whole event and he and Herb Deutsch spent hours and hours talking together about the possibilities of this new genre of electronic music and what equipment they could build. And that's when Bob built his first modules with Herb Deutsch that became the first ever Moog synthesizer. I was born in Ireland. My mother is Irish. I was born in a place to listen to ski, County for Manor, in the middle of Ireland. Was raised in England, had the first half of my career in England, an undergraduate degree in physics, so I was always interested in physics and then a PhD in sociology. I taught sociology for many years at York University in the UK before coming over to America to build this new department. We are in here of science and technology studies at Cornell University. It's an experimental department. Every project I've done has been trying to use the humanities and social sciences to get insight into one of the most important parts of our culture, which is science, technology and medicine. That this new field of science and technology studies is one of the few moments where uh, we have a scientist trying to reflect upon what they're doing and we give them the tools to do that. We've, I used to build shortwave radios as a kid in England, listen to shortwave radios. That's when I first heard electronic soundscapes tuning my huge radio which came from a Lancaster bomber from the Second World War with a huge dial on it. Some of them were jammed out with bagpipe sounds because it was the time of the Cold War, so the Russians were jamming the Americans, the Americans were jamming the Russians. You'd have 
was known as a beat frequency oscillator, so it worked the same principle as the Thurman, my shortwave radio. I went to Imperial College in 1970 as a physics student. I first encountered the VCS3 synthesizer, which was playing on a table beside the Socialist Society, and I soon got into it, built my own synthesizer, started playing out, listening to bands like Hawkwind were the cool band at the time, and I was into kind of like acid space rock. Then my academic career took off, but I always kept being a musician. It had less, I realized I had a career as a professional musician. What was really smart was going to be a really difficult career, especially given the amount of drugs we were taking back then. And it, I loved that spaced out music, but I realized just holding it together was going to be too hard. And I had this other career. I turned out to be good at writing, and I was had a great mentor, and I stumbled into a whole new field known as the sociology of scientific knowledge, just by luck almost. And I was a pioneer in that field, trying to understand science with the tools of social science. And then I moved on to technology and trying to understand medicine with the same approach. And then when I moved to Cornell University in 1990, I got to discover that Robert Moog, who of course I'd known of, and was kind of a hero of mine, had been a student here and he'd built his synthesizers in a tiny little place north of here called Trumansburg, and no one had ever written about him academically. So I saw this as a golden opportunity to write a book about the history of this one instrument and as I did that I started to interview all sorts of legendary musicians, prog rock people like Rick Wakeman and Keith Emerson who became a friend and uh, Don Preston who's also a friend who I played with who was Frank Zappa's synthesizer player and unknown musicians, incredible unknown musicians and engineers and I, they invited me to start playing, get my old synthesizer working so I've, writing that book has been great because I've been able to play again and rediscover that I hadn't lost the chops for making those weird sounds back from the dawn of synthesis and psychedelic music and now I can do it without so much of the drugs. <laughs> Which is important, I think we were just talking about this before surely, you know, you're playing a complicated patch you really have to be there, it's a difficult skill and I can hold it all together now and I'm playing in Letra Golem, playing in a band called the Atomic Forces, I get to play with great people like Shu Li Long, do they say Long? <laughs> Shu Li Ong. The famous Shuli Ong, multi instruments thermal, thermal player, God, I'm blabbering. I've always been at the margins and have been lucky because it's at the margins that the interesting things are done. So my advice is that um, um, uh, you need a lot of luck, but you've got to find a good research area you're passionate about. And if people are warning you off it, it's usually a, a good sign. It means there's probably going to be something really interesting there. And then the, the skill is to make it interesting to these people who told you it was uninteresting. 